And when the devil's out there talking all his trash, God's like, look at, look at the way. Look at the way. <laughs> oh, look at my people's right there. Look at my people's right there. Um, I th you said something about battle instructions. I'm going to give you all some battle instructions, even though I'm preaching to the choir. Because y'all are already doing it. But I just want to put some more injection and some more fuel in what you're already doing and give you some ideas. But I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would say, oh, that's a new way of looking at what I'm already doing. So God can multiply the, the power and leverage of this church to reach this community in ways that even y'all haven't even seen. Because what I, I, our eyes have not seen, our heart is not, under, our mind cannot understand the things God has. And God says, you think I've done something so far? I got something already for you. Can I get an amen? Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your creativity. Lord, you are, <laughs> we cannot even contain the joy and the passion that you have put in our heart. If I st stood here for 30 seconds and didn't say anything, people would start shouting because there's something bubbling up in their hearts. So I thank you for this opportunity. I pray for the next few minutes that you bring us to a place, a new place, a peaceful place, an empowering place, an anointed place that we can take one more step to be like you. Think like you, walk like you, look like you, love like you, forgive like you, be patient like you. Forgive like you. And I thank you for this church. I thank you for this family. I thank you for the conversion and transformation that you're bringing in, in this country through this place. We pray this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give someone a big hug. Give someone a big hug. Oh. How y'all doing? Um. My name is Miles McPherson. I grew up in New York, had a dream to play in the NFL. I was drafted to the Los Angeles Rams in 1982. I got cut, which means I got fired, <laughs> didn't get paid, went and played for the San Diego Chargers, played four years, started using cocaine uh, during my first year, went into a hotel. Someone pulled out cocaine. I vowed never to do cocaine. I was doing cocaine five minutes later. I was doing cocaine two years later. Um, Going to crack houses, didn't smoke crack, did cocaine, so I wasn't that bad because I wasn't doing crack. <laughs> I was sitting in the bathroom watching the guy make crack, and my buddy was in the next, next room hitting the pipe, and the guy making the crack had his little tank top on, he's all shriveled up, and I'm like, man, that dude is jacked up. And I'm sitting in front of the mirror in the bathroom. I say, that dude's jacked up. Look in the mirror, and God says, what about you? You're only this far away from him. My buddy comes to the door, gets the crack, hits the pipe in front of me, offers it to me. I'm like, nah, man. He said, you're strong. I said, no, I'm scared. You should see your eyes. His eyes roll back in his head. <laughs> I went to my whole, my, actually my apartment where I was laying on the couch, 5 o'clock in the morning. My chest was, heart was beating out of my chest. By the way, I was doing cocaine on the team plane, and I was in the bathroom of the team plane. We had a charter, obviously, and I would walk down the aisle all high, and um, there was two teammates in the aisle. The aisle was about that wide. They were this wide. And they stopped me in the aisle and said, yo, man, you're going to go to heaven. I said, well, yo, I went to Catholic school. I'm going to heaven. I got hit in the head by nuns. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> and this dude was 6'4", 225 pounds. He said, hey, little brother. I said, who are you calling little? And he looked down at me and says, you. I looked up and said, I'm just checking. Just want to make sure you we're here. <laughs> Share with me the gospel. I started thinking about it. And here I am sometime after that. Laying on my couch, 5 o'clock in the morning, my heart was pounding out of my chest. I had done cocaine all night, and a friend of mine had died of a heart attack from cocaine. So I said, I'm done. That day, I stopped doing cocaine, April 12, 1984. Got back on my girlfriend, been married 37 years. <laughs> Became a youth pastor shortly after that. Started Bible study in my house with some kids, and we had nine nationalities in my house. We had Filipino. I had never met a Filipino. I grew up in New York. I never met a Filipino. They were throwing beer bottles on my lawn. Any Filipinos in there? I know y'all got some Filipinos in here. Kamustaka? Kamustaka? Mabute. See, in, the, in, in Tagalog, in the Philippines, they say Kamustaka, like Komusta. That's how are you. And if you say I'm doing fine, you say Mabute. <laughs> For real, that's how you say it. You say Mabute. <laughs> so. <laughs> So these, these Filipinos are throwing beer bottles on my lawn. I, 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 I didn't know what I said. I said, yo, man, what, what are y'all? And they said, we Filipino, man. I said, okay, Filipino, man, stop throwing beer bottles on my lawn. And then we had a started, I started leading them to the Lord. I had nine nationalities in my house, which then it became a youth pastor, became a church. And that is what our church looks like. It looks like a demographic of San Diego, like this. This is awesome. 
So I um, get a call to go to the hospital to meet, to meet this girl, and she was in a car accident. And I was a young pastor, so I go to the hospital. She's in ICU. I wasn't sure. I'd never been to ICU, intensive care unit. Had my Bible. Had a real big Bible. When you're a young Christian, the bigger the Bible you have, the more spiritual you are. So I had this big old phone book sized Bible. I go to the ICU and I bang on the door. Boom, 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 boom. You're not supposed to bang on the door. The ICU people are dying. The nurse comes to the door. Shh. So I'm here to see so-and-so. She says, follow me. So I walk through ICU and I can hear the heart monitors, beep, beep, beep. I hear the respirators, pss, and I'm walking by all these dying people. And I get to the end, the last bed, and there's this girl laying on her back. She's white. Her arms are burnt black, and they're hanging from a, a frame above her. Her legs are both strapped to the ceiling, and they're amputated at her knees on both legs. She had nothing on her chest, one eye swollen shut, and a tube in her throat. Here I am with my big Bible, and I'm going to help her. And I look down at her, and I'm a young youth pastor. I don't know Jack. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> I know it's funny now, but it was like, so I go up to her and I said, um, and she doesn't know me. Her life has changed forever if she lives. She's bare-chested. She doesn't know me. And her whole world's upside down. I'm, I'm the least of her problems, by the way. And I say, um, I'm so-and-so. Your friend asked me to come. And she went, Ooh. I said, are you trying to ask me something? Ooh. Are you trying to tell me something? Ooh. And every time I asked her what who meant, she was Ooh, louder. And then she's shaking, ooh, 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 and I'm like, and the nurse who banged on the door, who I banged on the door, looked at, gave me, she came over, put a cloth on her chest. I move around to the other side of the bed. Now the girl's here. There's a bed behind me and the wall here. I'm almost killing this woman. And I said, I am out of here. And then they rolled the bed across the space for me to walk out. And God said, you're not going anywhere. I said, God, I am in shape. I will jump on these beds and run out of this place. You cannot keep me in here. I remember, I remember walking to my car faster and faster feeling like how ashamed I was as a pastor that could not help this woman. She was in critical condition. What was I thinking that I was going to go there and help her without being prepared to help her? And I think of how many cities, communities are like that woman. They're in critical condition. How many communities are in critical condition? How many blocks Housing projects are critical condition, and God sends a church, and the church does nothing. And the church is down the street doing their thing, and these people are dying right here. And if your church, and this ain't the case here, trust me, that's why I'm preaching to the choir. But if the church, so many churches die, um, shut down because of COVID, and nobody noticed. Wow. <laughs> nobody noticed because they were like me when I went in that day with this big old Bible with no power, no anointing, no knowledge, no ability, no passion. And here you are, setting an example for these churches all around here and these people out here that the gospel does work. I want to talk to you about being what we call a do something church. Everyone say do something. Oh, by the way, in our church, we have this thing where, where when, when, when I say, who's the man? Thank you. <laughs> Come on, girl. Watch out now. <laughs> Watch out now. When, we, when, when I say who's the, or anybody says who's the man, you, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You, don't be trying to do it the way way. <laughs> you got to do it the rock way, okay? <laughs> Our church is called the rock church. Okay, so you have to say it with a dip. You got to say Jesus like that. Are y'all Are you ready? Okay, so when you go to heaven, we're going to have our own section. You can come visit, but then you've got to go back to your section. Okay? So, who's the man? Jesus! All right, all right. Who's the man? Jesus! And, 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 and here is the rule that anywhere you are in the community, you can be in a movie theater, walking in the mall, you're driving down the street, standing on the corner. If someone yells that at you, you are bound by law to respond. I was in the movie theater, in the back of the movie theater. And it was, I don't remember what the movie was, it didn't matter, but they showed an exorcist preview. 
Exorcist 37 or something like that. And right at the end of the, <laughs> end of the preview, you know, whoever the person is in the, this demon-possessed one, and it was silent in the movie. And someone said, Jesus, like, get that demon out of this place. Come on now. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about being a Do Something Church. A Do Something Church is a church that does four things that Jesus did when he was on the earth. Count. Everyone say count. count. Say walk. walk. Say ask. ask. Say love. love. This is our outreach philosophy. We have 75 uh, volunteer-led ministries. We do about $4 million of volunteer service. We count. We actually calculate. Here's how much money we are saving you, Mayor. Wow. And tell them every year. Here's what we're saving you. You, can do, you, do, you do the same. You're, you're doing millions of dollars of, of volunteer service. It's, it's amazing. But count, walk, ask, love. Now, all throughout the Bible, Jesus sends deliverers to people who are suffering. I want to show you. Turn to Exodus if you have a Bible. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. We'll go to the, to the biggest deliverer of the Old Testament is Momo. <laughs> Momo. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3, you know the burning bush experience. Jesus says in verse 7, he said, I have surely seen, everyone say seen. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. Say, I heard. I've heard their cry and I know of their, their sorrow. Say, no. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up to a good land, the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Uptite, and out of sight. So I, I understand their pain. Here's the thing. Here's what God's saying to Moses. Moses, I know the little girls that are getting molested. I know. I know. I know the women who are getting abused. I know the people who are addicted. I know the people who are oppressed. I, I'm right there with them. So I need you to go. If you look to the Bible, he sent Moses in Judges. He sent all the judges when the Philistines were, were he sent Samson when the Midianites, he sent Gideon. And, and he kept sending his deliverers, handpicked to deliver the people who were oppressed. And then he sent his son Jesus. And then his son Jesus says, I got to go and I got to trust you now. So there's people hurting right now. We all know this. And God says, I got to send you. I can't send the government. I, the government's going to mess it up. The government can't do what you can do. I, I, I can't send the business people. Then they, the business people can fuel what you can do, but no one can do what you can do because what I'm going to put on you, and you can't get it, Kmart. It's going to be the Holy Ghost anointing. So we're going to talk about a Do Something Church because there are, tra the, the, the girl in the hospital, let's say her name is Tracy. There are communities that are Tracy's. Communities that are dying, critical condition. You know this real, and he needs us. You, I, I want to encourage you, please don't get, don't get used to what you have seen. Don't get used to what you do. Don't get used to the stories you hear about other people in this church doing amazing things. And you're saying, well, I go to a great church. They do great things. They're doing this. And then you go home and be comfortable. Don't, don't be that person. You got to be that person. I got to get in the game. One of the things about, you know, professional sports, I, I, it's not like this in high school, it's not like this in college, but in professional sports, everybody wants to play. <laughs> we want to play. Matter of fact, if you come into an NFL locker room before the game, you probably never get to do that, but if you ever do, it's like dudes are like gladiators. They, someone's going to die today. <laughs> People are going to get hurt. So we're taping up, sweating, walking around like this, like, you know, just like, you, you know, don't talk people just like hitting their heads on the wall and everybody got that thing. And so I lived that for years and years. And then I went into a Major League Baseball locker room. Baseball. Samuel Padres. I go in a locker room and dudes are like eating hot dogs, watching Dr. Phil. And I'm walking in, it's like 15 minutes before the game. I'm like, yo, man, should I leave? Aren't y'all going to, like, get in, get in, like, get, you, get, you, get in the huddle? And we got 15 minutes. <laughs> we do this 186 times a year. We ain't jacked up. Let me tell you something. You never, and I'm not saying baseball players are complacent. They do play 186 games. We play 16. But my point is this. You never want to get complacent. You want to come to church, get up every day saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? You got to, you got to, you got to go, you got, when, when we, when we come out of football, we're like looking for opportunity, looking for somebody to hit, looking for someone to lay out. And, and, and there is going to be blood. Oh, this we have doctors on our sideline, multiple. Why? Because people are going to get hurt because this is a violent game. Ministry is not for the weak. 
When you go to the store, you got to say, God, God, who do you want me to minister to? How do you want me to pray? So what I'm going to tell you right now is something you can do before you leave this room. I'm going to tell you something you can do before you leave your seat. You're like, ah, come on. I'm going to tell you something you can do right before you leave your seat. So count, walk, ask. Number one is count. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. I'm a numbers person. I love numbers. I was an engineering student. Took four years of calculus. I count things for pleasure. I get take pleasure out of numbers. And I know some of y'all don't like that, and uh, uh, but that's okay. And and, about, and by the way, all the, all these people who, if if you don't like math, raise your hand. You're lying. Here's why. Um, Mr. Manager, I have seven days of vacation left. That's math. <laughs> My, my, my check is wrong. That's math. Okay. All throughout the Bible, at least twice in every chapter, God uses a number to measure something. You can't measure anything without a number. So if someone says, I had a, a, a pastor of mine said, oh, the ministry was great. It was, it was full. I said, how many people were there? I don't know. Well, then what you say means anything. You can't measure anything without a number. Jesus was, uh, Noah, Jonah was in the belly of the whale four days. Excuse me? Three. Thank you. Jesus said before the, the crow, how many times? God so loved the world that he gave us what? One and only son. Numbers are very important. If God had 5,000 sons, then what's one? But he had one. That's it. He uses numbers, numbers, numbers. You can't measure, you can measure love with numbers. Ladies, how many roses do you get is a, is, a, is a measurement. How often you get roses is a measurement. How much time before your man tells you you look good when you put on a new dress? There's a measurement. You count them in seconds. I walked in house one day and I, I walked around, walking around the living room and right, my wife was over here out of my peripheral vision and she says, did you notice what I had on? And I froze, thinking if I freeze, she won't see me. I'll blend into the furniture. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-oh. Why? Because I had a certain amount of time before I was supposed to acknowledge and recognize what happened on her. It was in her head. It's a number. So I started looking in the TV to see if I could see a reflection of what she was wearing so I could say, oh, yeah, I know you got that red thing on. That you got, I know. I was just going to tell you later. <laughs> Luke chapter 17, there were 10 lepers. Jesus is going to heal all ten. One going to come back and say thank you. Look what it says. Verse 11. Now it happened as they went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered in a certain village and there he met ten men who were lepers. How many lepers? Ten. Were there nine? Ten. Were there eleven? Ten. There were ten. Say ten. ten. Very specific. And they lifted up their voice and said, Master, Master, have mercy. Now, when you had leprosy, you had your limbs would curl up, your vocal cords would get nodules, and you talk like that, your limbs would fall off, and you'd walk like this. So everybody do this, like thriller, remember thriller? Give me this, give me this, give me this. Come on now, don't be so bougie, you can't give me this. Say with me, say, Master, have mercy on us. Okay, this, 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 these stories are awesome. And it says, so when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. So watch this, watch this. They're over here because you, you, you had to stay 30 feet away from a leper if the wind was blowing because the cooties could fly off you and get on them, okay. So they're like, master, give it to me. Have mercy on us. Jesus is over here and he says, go show yourself to the priest. And then he says to the disciples, it's not in the Bible, but I was there and I knew it. He says, watch this. They go, okay, we're going to go to the priest. They were healed, just like that. Ah, you know, not getting the story, you're not getting the story. And it says, and one of them, when he saw it, returned healed with a loud voice, glorifying God. How many were healed? It's not a trick story. How many were healed? How many came back and said thank you? How many did not say thank you? Are you the one of the nine? 
but, but, but I'm going to ask you a different question. I'm going to ask you a different question. That was for free. That was just a little something, something. You don't have to pay for that one. How many lepers are in San Bernardino? How many homeless people? How many convalescent homes? What percentage of the people in the convalescent homes don't get a visitor? 60%. How many people die? How many people raped? How many divorces? How many, how many police chiefs? How many fire chiefs? How many students in schools? If you do not know that, then how are you making a target for the goal that you are going to reach the minister to? Because the devil will say, oh, you got some, that's good enough, pat yourself on the back and you're good. You have 214,706 people in San Bernardino, 6,259 square miles, two abortion clinics, three adult bookstores. This is what we got, maybe better. Three battered women's homes, two foster care uh, uh, centers, two homeless shelters, four hospitals, one prison, two senior citizen centers. Now, whether those numbers are right or wrong, that's what we got. We have a website called dosomethingchurch.org where you can actually put in your address and put in a radius, five, ten miles, and put in convalescent home. It will tell you where they are. That's count. Everyone say count. If you can't count it, you can't measure it. So number two is walk. Say walk. Let me demonstrate. I'm going to demonstrate. This is walking. Some of y'all may walk like this. Some of y'all may walk like this. It's still the same concept. Your feet and legs are moving and you are going from one location to another. You are not sending the flyer saying come to me. We are going to come to you. Look what it says in Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter... 11, Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is so interesting. Verse 22. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, to walk in his ways and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out these nations before you and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourself. And then it says, every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. From the wilderness to the Lebanon. In, in, in the Old Testament, when you would buy property, they would take your shoe off and you would give it to somebody because it was your deed of trust. Because you claimed the property by walking on the property. That's why Jesus came and walked on the earth. He was claiming the earth. He said, this is mine and I'm going to take it and I'm going to have it. And so when we stand in our church, the devil is standing in front of institutions, schools, bank, whatever it is. And he's saying, this is mine. You go to your little church, little because he's compared it to the whole. He says, you go to your church and then you go home, but this is mine. No, 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 no. We're going into the place. We, we, had, we had these women that were, we, we had a ministry called JC's Girls, Jesus Christ Girls. They were going into strip clubs to minister to strippers. And they were, some of them were former strippers, some of them were not, but they were going, they would get their little pink shirt and their little pink the little bag and the little smell good and a little letter from God and the little pink stuff. And they would go in there and sit, wait for the girls to dance. Then they would go to minister them in the back. They would go to the hospital when they kill themselves, go to court with them, and they minister to them, right? So it was pretty cool. So they're sitting in the, in the strip club, and these guys are sitting over here watching the girls on the pole, wondering why these girls are in there watching the girls on the pole. So these guys say, what y'all doing? And these ladies, say, they're from my church, the Rock Church. They say, we're from the Rock Church. Well, these guys said, we're from the Rock Church too. Oh, snap. Now, here's the thing. They didn't know they were from the Rock Church. The devil did. Because you, when you carry the anointing of God wherever you go, spirits and demons got to move. Now, you have to understand... The, de the devil is standing at the door saying, don't come in here. And we go, oh, we can't go in there. We're too saved. We can't go in the bar. We're too Who says so? It's just a building. And then you have to say, no, no, we, we counted. We have a strip club there, strip club there, bar there. Now we are going to walk into that place and carry the anointing of God. And we're going to see what God does. It even gets better, it gets better than that. So two years ago, the strip club closed down. There's two of them right next to each other. And these businessmen called me and said, hey, will you buy the strip club with us? It's like, buy the strip club? 
like, is it, is it operating? I mean, how, how's that going to work? He's like, no, no, it's closed down. I said, well, we, we, don't, we, don't, we didn't put it in our budget, strip club money, you know, to buy the strip club. <laughs> they said, we'll give you part of the, we'll give you, we'll buy your share with our money. So we own a strip club today. We bought it, and they, we bought them all out have since then, and we're going to turn it into a transitional living center for people out of tra human trafficking. So the devil... The devil said, no, this is my house. Oh, no, this is God's house now. And that's what's going to happen in that building. Everyone say count. Say count. Say walk. Say ask. In our arrogance as believers, because we got the word of God, we got Jesus. In our arrogance, we tell people what they need. We tell people where they're going. And rightfully so, they don't want to be around us. But what if we asked? This is something you can do. <laughs> blind Bartimaeus, heal me, heal me. He's he blind. He was calling out to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, how can I help you? Imagine if our posture was that you counted the mayor, the police chief, the superintendent of the school, and you walked to them. You counted, you walked, and then you said, how can we help you? Wow. You started the church by doing that very thing, going to the people's house. We want to start a church, but we don't know what your need is, so how can we help you? That's exactly what you did. That's exactly why you have this, if, in case you didn't know. And, and, and to go up, you, this is something, imagine going to Starbucks. This is, this is like the most powerful, simple ministry you could have. How many of y'all go to Starbucks? Okay, how many of y'all go to a store? Okay, how many of y'all come out of your house? <laughs> y'all are. <laughs> Imagine you going to Starbucks and you get up to the front of the line and you, you're going to order your frappuccino, licky like a bushy, licky baka. And then you say to the person, um, how can I pray for you? Here's the going to uh, 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 uh. uh. I'm good. And they're going to be like, whoa. I never caught that. And then next time you come in, you order your frappuccino ticket lockable, and you say, how can I pray for you? Come back next time. How can I pray for you? One day, one day, she's going to put your frap right here. You're going to go to grab your frap, and she's going to grab your hand, and she's going to pull you and say, my mother got cancer. You can do that before you leave here right now. You can text somebody before you leave here and say, how can I pray for you? What can I do for you? This is called ministry. And we, we as the big C church, the little C church, an individual can go to leaders and community leaders and, and school districts and police departments and say, we, we go to our mayor every year and say, and we've done this for 10, 15 years. What can we do for you? What do you need? You want to paint the Coronado Bridge? It's the bridge that goes from San Diego over the bay. It's like it's impossible to paint, but we asked anyway because it'd be fun. <laughs> what would you like us to do? And they go, Well, we we don't really know. What? Uh, let's think about it. And imagine if the church had that posture corporately and individually that we would go to people and say, hey, hey, how can we help you? And how can we serve you? We have resources. And if we don't have them, God will supply them because he wants to get the glory through the church. So tell us what you need. And then the, and the, and the, last, the last thing is love. Everyone say love. When you ask somebody what you can do for them, you do not do what they say. You're like, that's kind of counterproductive. Yo, how can I help you? Well, can you do this? No. Because <laughs> what if you ask somebody, hey, how can I help you? And the guy said, yo, can you buy me a 40 ounce? <laughs> and you were, oh, I really love you. I'm going to buy you 80. <laughs> you don't do that. You respond in love. Um, how many of y'all would agree that women are complicated? Well, let me ask you this. I'm sorry. All the fellas, put your hands out. How many ladies would agree that ladies are complicated? Thank you. Okay. Now, fellas, can we now all agree now? Fellas? Okay. I'm going to explain to you why women are complicated. This will solve everything for you. It won't solve it because they won't fix it, but at least you'll understand. 
every woman has their own way that they want to be loved. They have certain flowers they like, certain colors, certain, certain frequency, certain uh, uh, age of the flower. They don't want a dead flower. They want a plump flower. They, there's certain things they want you to say in certain time frames when they put clothes on. They have certain ways they want you to love them, hold them, hug them, etc. Can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. All the ladies say hey. Amen. Very good. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's your problem. You need to get over this. You need to tell us. <laughs> they think that what they're supposed to know. <laughs> it's maddening. <laughs> and then when you figure it out, they change it. They don't tell you they changed it. Here's the thing. Here's what God said. I'm going to tell you how to love me. I'm going to make it really clear. Do what I say. God don't care what you feel. I don't feel like it. So? I can kill you. This is God. I can kill you and I'll be okay. And it's okay because I'm God. I'm not going to do that. But this has nothing to do with what you feel. I just want you to do what I say when I want you to do it, how I want you to do it. And if you say you love God and don't do what you, he says, you don't love God. If you say you love God and hate your brother that you can see and say you love God, you can, you're a liar. The Bible calls you a liar. My daughter, when she was going to break up with her boyfriend, I said, let me help you out. I was like, I, I'm loving this. She said, I don't think it's working out. I said, let me, here's how you break up with your boyfriend. Everyone say broken record. Say broken record. I said, here's what you're going to say. You're just going to say this one sentence. It ain't working out. And that's it. The more you talk, the higher the chance he's going to try to change. You're going to change your mind. You just go, come on, girl. You got someone you need to break up with? Listen to me. I don't know where you're at, but listen to me. It ain't going to work out. Everyone say broken record. What do broken records do? They say the same. Y'all don't even know what a record is. Let me, what am I saying? They don't, do y'all even know what a record is? It's a black disc that has grooves in it, and it goes around, and you put a needle on it, and music comes out. How many of you have never seen a record? Get a life. Go to Google, please. Something. When these broken records, they, they, it's grooves, and, and it would turn, and the needle would, <laughs> it would do that. And when it got a, a nick or a scratch, it would go, Michael Jackson, who? Michael Jackson, who? Michael Jackson, who? It wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't play. It would just say the same thing over and over again. So when you're going to break up with somebody, I told my daughter, listen, when he says, oh, baby, please, you say, it ain't going to work out. I'm going to change. I'll do anything you want. It ain't going to work out. I, I'm going to buy you flowers. It ain't going to work out. I'm going to be there. It ain't going to You say the same thing over and over and over and over and over. When you do a deposition, when you're on trial and they in, in, interrogate you, which I've been, if they, they, they try to trick you and they ask you the same question in intervals in different words to see if they can trick you. And my lawyer said, when he asked you the same question, even though the lawyer's job is to say this, I jumped in before the lawyer because I started to like it. And so when someone asks you the same question, you say, asked and answered. You asked it and I answered it. So I'm not going to answer it again. And then five minutes later, he, and I would say asked and answered. So I told my, my daughter, broken record, you, he, you, he's asked and you've answered. You say, I got to, it ain't going to work out. It ain't going to work out. Because in negotiation, when someone presents a price, when you're going to buy something, whoever speaks first loses the argument. So when he says, when I told my daughter, it ain't going to work out. It ain't going to work out. It ain't going to work out. What's my point? When you're serving the community, serving your neighbor, serving your family, and they ask you to do something, your broken record is, I have to obey God. You have no other choice. You have no other option. And as you walk every day in your Christian life, when you walk into this church, out of this church, into your home, into your job, into your school, you have no choice. I must obey God. I must obey God. I must obey God. And you get up every day with that in your head. 
In a minute, we're going to pray. I know my time is up. In a minute, we're going to pray. And I know, listen, y'all are passionate about God. Y'all are passionate about worship. Y'all are passionate about service. Y'all are passionate about helping the poor. But there may be somebody here. You may say, Lord, and, and I don't know, it doesn't matter where you're at on the scale, but there may be somebody here saying, one, I just need to t- take one more step to be like Jesus. I, I need to take one more step to be battle ready because I got my battle instructions. I need, I need one more step to be faithful. I need one more step to be like Jesus. And, and by the way, I might not even feel like it, but I just know it's the right thing to do for me today. And so as we pray, I want you to think about who you are because someone else's life is at stake because of what you do. Someone else's salvation is at stake because of your obedience. Because God doesn't want you, and, and I know the pastor doesn't want you, church doesn't want you to just come, fill the seat, go home. In football, in football, you go to the football game and they have a huddle. Huddles, 11 people get in a circle. We call the play. And the reason they have the huddle is because there was a deaf school called Gallaudet University back east, and, and they would call the plays with their hands, so they created the huddle so no one could see the play. That's where the huddle came from. So now NFL, all and football players, they have the huddle and they call the play. By the way, you would never, if you heard the play, it would sound like a foreign language to you. Another story. But no one goes to the game to see the play. You go to the game. I mean, no one goes to the game to see the huddle. You go to the game to see what they're going to do when they get out of the huddle. This is our huddle right here. This is our huddle. This ain't the game. The game is what happens when we walk outside and say, okay, now I got my instructions. I got my inspiration. I got my clarity. Now I got to go do it. But some of y'all, hmm, you're saying, Lord, I need, I, need, I need an extra touch to go do it. Because what you've been calling me to do, I don't feel equipped to do. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and pray. And we're going to pray. And then I'm going to call you up forward. I know you have a ministry team, right? They'll be up here. I got COVID um, May 8th, and I was sick for three and a half weeks, and it's been seven weeks or so, six, seven weeks, and I still have flashbacks to that sickness up until this today. And in that time, one of the many, many, many things God showed me, and by the way, if, as I'm speaking, if you feel led to get out of your seat, just come on down here. I know the ministry seems coming, but if you want to just come, just come. But in that time, God was showing me my mortality. He says, I'm going to show you the weakness of your mortality and the power of your mortality. The weakness is that you're nothing but dirt. The power is, if you submit that dirt to me, I will blow on it. And it will be supernatural. So I'm going to break you down and bring you down to nothing so I can build you up a whole new person. God wants to do that in your life. Sometimes you may feel like, man, my life is so messed up. I'm so lost. I feel so dirty sometimes and so useless sometimes and so depressed and empty sometimes. And God says, "Mm mm-hmm. But it's that emptiness that I can fill with my power. But you've got to surrender it to me. So eyes closed, heads bowed. Anytime you feel led, just get up out of your seat. But if you would like just a prayer, encouragement, a word. By faith, you want to step out of your boat as Peter st- stepped out of the boat to walk to Jesus. By faith, you want to step out of your boat, not even knowing what's going to happen. You just know it's time for you to walk away from what you are to something you're going to be. Pray this prayer with me, and then I'm going to ask you to come. In the privacy of your heart, pray, dear God, I know you love me. (laughs) I know you have something better for me than what I have. I know you want me to be something better than I am. And I know I just need to surrender. I need to obey. I need to submit. I need to realize it's not about me. (laughs) It's so much more important. Holy Spirit, fall on me. Fill me, empower me, move my legs to get up out of my seat, (laughs) encourage me, give me clarity of purpose, and give me the courage to walk out of myself, past my fear and my pain and my doubt and the darkness in my life.
to walk into the light of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. I assume we have a song that we're going to sing. Okay. As they sing this song, I'm going to ask if you prayed that prayer, step up st to stand up on the count of three. And then as you stand up, I'm going to ask you to come forward and we're going to sing. One, two, three. If you prayed that prayer, stand up out of your seat, come up out of your seat, and come on down to the front. Come on, come on. Just come up out of your seat and come on down. Come on down. Come on. Let's give him a hand. Let's give him a hand. Come on, out of your seat. Come on. I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you can feel me. Now, spirit, when you move, you make my heart come. When you feel the room. God is calling you right now to get up out of your seat. Come on. Pastor Miles, a round of applause tonight. What a great, great word. Everyone that came up right now, we're going to lead you in a prayer. A prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I just want to rededicate my life. We're going to lead you in this prayer. And today, you're going to start your new life. Maybe you're at your seat right now and you're thinking, man, I should have went down there. It's okay. You can say that prayer right there at your seat. People are still coming down. Give them a round of applause. Come on down. Yeah. Come on down. This is your day. This is your day. As people are still making their way down, you guys, tomorrow, Tori Roberts, you don't want to miss it. We have an amazing time tomorrow night, same time, 7 o'clock. And after we lead everyone here to Jesus, we say this prayer for God to forgive us of our sins. If you need prayer about anything, after we say this prayer, come on down. We'd love to pray with you. If everyone could bow their head and close their eyes for a moment. Maybe you're watching us online right now. You're at home. You're at your job. Wherever you're at, you're watching us online. You're saying, man, I need to rededicate my life to Christ. Or I want Jesus to forgive me. Right there where you're at, join us in this prayer. Every head bow, every eyes close. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus. I surrender my life to you. I ask forgiveness of all my sins. Jesus, today, come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. Set me free from all my bad habits, all my addictions. Today, I am born again. Holy Spirit, fill me. Set me free. Today, I'm a new person. Today, I start my new life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys give Jesus a round of applause. Look at all these people getting saved today. Everybody that came forward, just hang out for a few. We want to exchange information with you. If anybody needs prayer, come on down. We'd love to pray with you. Our team is here. Continue to pray this week. Tijuana, Mexico, they're going out tomorrow to set up for the church. Pray for Pomona. Kenya, Africa, but tomorrow, tomorrow night, we are back here at 7 o'clock. And if God is for you, who could come against you? You guys have a wonderful night. If anybody needs prayer, come on down. We'd love to pray with you guys. God bless you guys. We'll see you back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for night number three of our 17-year anniversary.